It is that time again. Uh, we have this week a very interesting conversation about solar energy uh, in the multifamily space, really real estate at large. But before we get into it, let me introduce uh, our guest. Mel Bergschneider is executive account manager at Illum Energy, responsible for business development in the United States market. As the first U.S.-based employee at Illum Energy, Mel leads the Australian-born startups expansion across target markets such as California, New York, and Florida. Mel works closely with affordable housing providers, solar installers, and real estate developers to provide solar energy benefits to participating tenants. Previous experience includes working in energy efficiency in San Francisco, installing solar at Women's Cooperative in Nicaragua, and supporting sustainable development in the Amazon rainforest. Now, prior to joining Illum Energy, Mel worked in energy equity at Grid Alternatives and in energy efficiency at Carbon Lighthouse. She also interned in the Amazon rainforest at Fundacion Runa and was a community coach at Greenpeace USA, serving as a director of sustainability at Residence Hall Association. Mel has dedicated her career towards fighting climate change. And in that path, she found a passion for solar energy. Mel holds a BA from Indiana University in Bloomington in entrepreneurship, corporate innovation and sustainable business. She also holds a certification in energy innovation and emerging technologies, as well as an energy management and systems technology from Stanford University. Now, this was an educational conversation for me. Solar and uh, green energy is not something that I put a lot of time or uh, resource uh, or energy into. Not that I don't think it's important. It's just not been a passion of mine to learn uh, much about it. That all changed with this conversation that I had with Mel. I have a desire now to learn a little bit more about the technology, about what it means uh, in the bigger scheme of things. Uh, Mel was a fantastic guest. Uh, she was gracious uh, in delivering her answers to me in the sense that I didn't know a lot. And uh, so I did a lot of research prior to this interview uh, just so that I could at least ask some questions that I thought were uh, valuable for you, the audience, and certainly for Mel and the time that she invested with Multifamily Collective. So please enjoy this conversation with Mel Bergschneider. Mel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So excited. Yeah, I, I, I think as I was sharing right before we hit record, this is a, a topic that I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with or a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of knowledge. So I'm really excited to talk to you to sort of imbue it in my mind. Uh, but first, where in the world are you today? Like, where do you live and where are you coming from? Yeah, so right now I'm based in LA. Um, I did want to mention from the get-go, just in case if people hear an accent, I was born and raised in Colombia. Um, so yeah, a lot of my kind of the Spanglish comes in and out. <laughs> so you might be oh, able to awesome. hear it throughout. So yeah, but uh, yeah, it's been a, a really great time in California and, and especially working in the solar industry. Oh, I love it. I was I was in Irvine week before last, so uh -huh. uh, I got to tell you, your weather there is uh, makes me jealous. I know, I know. Oh, I get a little beautiful. spoiled sometimes because then whenever it's just slightly cold, I'm just like, oh god. <laughs> but then <laughs> the rest of the country, I'm, yeah, I I can't complain. I won't complain. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's always fun to see uh, people. I, I love cold weather, so I go out without a jacket in, down into the 40s and 50s. And uh, but I see people who like if it gets in the 70s, it's like bring out the parka, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really cold. Yeah, you can see that a lot here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fun. Um, okay, so I I want to unpack this in a way that is that is thoughtful. So mm -hmm. maybe as a uh, from a high level perspective, we have both viewers and listeners because we're on podcasts and we're on YouTube. Um, so maybe from your perspective, somebody who's in the industry, mm -hmm. sort of set the stage for us, give us a little bit of context uh, for unpacking a conversation about solar. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the first thing that comes to mind about solar and why we're talking about it in a real estate environment is it is a growing industry um, and it's also a massive, massive opportunity. Uh, we can take a look at it from a financing perspective. We can take a look at it from a interest in tenants perspective, from a differentiation of your asset perspective. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, of ways that we can go into. Mm -hmm. I think that's the beauty of uh, kind of merging industries where you can actually create a bit of a value add or a little bit of a edge uh, to an industry if you're bringing in like what's the, what's the hot topic now. Um, so yeah, super excited to be talking about solar. Yeah, definitely. So um, maybe just to give you a little insight into my lack of knowledge for this. So 10 or 15 years ago, I was living in St. Louis and um, I'm going to use the word progressive. I don't mean it in a pejorative way, but I had a friend who was very progressive, forward thinking, looking out at the horizon all of the time. Mm -hmm. He put solar panels on the roof of a, I'm going to say it was like a five-story building, maybe like 40 apartments uh, in downtown St. Louis in an urban environment. And his his hope at the time was that I think there was like a seven year payback period, but that building would become sort of self-sustaining in the way of creating enough right. energy through the solar panels to actually, he wasn't selling back to the grid at the time, but he was at least uh, yeah. you know, offsetting a lot of uh, costs for himself. So that's all I know. Oh, about. I mean, you're, re you're really ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> that being, I'm, it sounds pretty incredible, I think, uh, and even for the time. So just to give you and the listeners a bit of background of why this is important. Um, I'll give a background on who we are and what I do for the company. So uh, the company is called Alum Energy. And what we do is we're an international company that has created a product called SoulShare. And the product enables one single solar system to be actually shared, <laughs> like a better word, or distributed to multiple meters in the same building. So if we take a look at that example and the, your friend that was so ahead of the time, mm -hmm. uh, you can have the solar system connected in our device and actually distribute that power to all of the participating meters. Um, so what is different is that, and maybe some of the listeners are used to this, in which you think about solar and real estate, you only think about the common area or the clubhouse. Or it's like, okay, let me put on some solar, but it's only going to uh, take care of some operating costs. And that's about it. But what we're actually offering is thinking about solar as a benefit to the tenants in which you're actually with the solar share, you're actually connecting and delivering that power to the tenants. And then we can get into the nitty gritty of, of how to recuperate the investment. But essentially, you would create a bit of an amenity fee in which it becomes a a revenue stream uh, to the asset owner. So almost as, as asset owners are looking into amenities, for example, if somebody is looking for a new apartment, like does it have AC? Um, does it have a pool? Um, how cool would it be to actually like filter for, does it have solar connected? Because I know my bills or in this utility territory are super high. Um, so yeah, that could become more and more of a something that tenants can seek out for. So, so my head, I, I tend to like think way out into the, to the distance. And when you provide prompts like that, I'll, I'll tell you where my head went. Yes. Uh, and I think this is really cool if, if this is true, in fact. So maybe this becomes our end point, but then we can work backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I hear you saying is I set up the system on my property. Mm -hmm. And if I'm sort of philanthropic in nature, I pipe it out to all the units. I create a scenario where the resident has zero electricity bill, right? Potentially a zero electricity bill. Um, in a perfect world, they would you would supply enough energy to the building that there's like you're selling it back, so there's a chance to rev share with the resident, which is my punchline. Right. If you rev share with a resident, my imagination tells me they become a little more sticky, right? <laughs> Retention <laughs> rates might go up at your community because, hey, I'm saving right. you money, but I'm also paying. Is that kind of where this thing is headed so, at some point? Yeah. I mean, there's there's actually been studies um, around <coughs> the tenant retention part uh, with a yeah. lot of these energy efficiency and retrofits uh, side. So yeah, there has been some um, some ways to prove in which, yeah, a tenant is more likely to stay. Uh, because what you're doing is reducing the overall cost of uh, their living, um, utilities being part of that. So in that case, uh, that is that is exactly what we want to do, in which 
we're reducing as much of the utility grid expend uh, from the tenant side, but you're actually, yeah, you're producing and consuming power on site, um, which is, to me is like a really cool thing in which real estate can move not only into the the housing um, part of things, but like how much of a self-sustaining yeah. asset it could be, almost like with the example, example that you were giving earlier. So that just opens the possibilities. So we should just do our call to action right here. Like what's holding you up? You should make a decision today to do this thing, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think a part of it is really like the bridging <laughs> of the industries. And that's where I'm like, all right, if we have more, more people speaking both languages um, of like, okay, we'll help you decrease operating expenditures and we'll help you uh, increase NOI. Um, which is something that we see a lot with uh, energy efficiency and renewables. What is different here is really bringing in the tenant uh, experience and the tenant well-being into the equation, which it does translate into, you know, it can also help with brand reputation. It can also help, as we were talking about, um, the the retention. Um, and I, I do think that there's a a whole world of financial benefits or rebates mm -hmm. that once you start digging more into it, it's it's a it's a wild time in a good way of like you know all these tax credits, all these uh, renewal energy incentives that are gonna make the financials even better. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of here as a as a bit of like in the middle, like all right, how do we actually make sure that the real estate and the renewable industry are talking to each other so that you know we can share some of those of of those lessons and then you know share some of the benefits so talk to me i have to imagine and there could be a a number of reasons why this might be the case but mm -hmm. um I, I imagine there's potentially some resistance to solar from traditional thinkers um, or even kind of old school thinkers, not, not to discount old school thinkers, but, um, mm -hmm. or even regulation or municipalities that are like all these players as it relates to what you do. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, how do you, how do you start to have this conversation, uh, which I think is one of really education right. how do you start to have that conversation and how do you go about like bringing people together so that they can wrap their heads around the benefit yeah yeah i think uh, there's a lot of similarities between solar development and real estate development <laughs> uh, oh. in which yeah in which when you take a look at a potential asset you know there's so much nitty-gritty that goes behind the scenes like not only you know, think about your engineering diagrams, think about the people you have yeah. to convince and think about the access of capital, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a very similar situation with solar in which um, you want to make it as simple as possible, obviously. And then the there's the question of the capital availability, which now sure. is being addressed more and more. There's a lot of green financing options available. Um, there's, you know, we're just having a webinar about um, CPAs and, and different ways to bundle in pays financing into, you know, mm -hmm. if you would be uh, replacing your roof, why not bundle solar in it as well? Mm -hmm. So it's all these things where you're like, you're already doing the legwork of a lot of these development, either real estate or solar parts. Why not? combine it so you don't have to go through the timeline yeah. all over again but rather kind of have a, a more parallel timeline um so yeah i think that's probably one of the biggest items shout out to real estate developers and know the like the not only the jurisdictions but uh, the financing all these puzzle pieces that need to come together for a project to go um i think we definitely share a lot of the 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 lessons and the uh, success as well as the frustrations uh when it comes to these projects so yeah it's more, more similar than you think of yeah well you that was very well said because i i've lived on the the development side i'm right. not a developer but i've uh -huh. been in the rooms with individuals who do development and it is to your point it's very very complex in there yeah. 
It's there are any number of government agencies that are, are at play at any given time, mm-hmm. not to mention general contractors and people who are doing goods and services. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. So I, I definitely, I see the similarities. Um, and I also see a lot of the opportunities when it comes to these developments. Like once they're finalized, you kind of take a look at them and you're like, oh my God, this is like all, you can almost like look back all the time and all the resources and stakeholders that had to come together. And now you see it like right in front of you, um, which, you know, I've had that feeling with some solar projects that we've had, like it's particularly in the Southeast where it's like, all right, here's, here's the result. Here's the, uh, the actual proof. Um, so yeah, super exciting to see. So b- before we get to unpacking like a case study and like what, mm-hmm. what actually does happen in a financial perspective or even in a, in a resident perspective, um, h- how, so I imagine when you're, you're sitting in a room and you're trying to convince somebody that this is a, is a very good thing. There, there are, he- there are like traditional resistance, right? Mm-hmm. In, in some cases, not every case. Cause I, I think that thought process is shifting, but what mm-hmm. are some of the traditional, like, yeah, I hear you, but yeah. kind of responses that you get. I'm just out of curiosity. Yeah. Um, I think some of them are, <clears throat> I want to say, because they're not used to solar uh, and they don't see kind of the the benefit of solar as much, um, mm-hmm. where when we actually do the financial modeling, then you actually see the dollars and cents and, and you actually yeah. take a look at payback, et cetera. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, now I get it. <laughs> Um, I think the other part, yeah, I think the other part, it has to do a bit with the like hold periods. So for example, you know, this sounds great, but Hey, I'm actually about to sell the property or actually, I'm not sure if we're going to keep the property the next year. I don't know if it's worth almost like back to the analogy of of development, uh, which happens here is like, I'm not sure if it's worth going through like the process if the property is not going to be in our hands. So that's one thing that it's expected. But I also want to say a lot of these portfolio owners, they will also have properties which they know they're like, no, we're long term holders, or we just purchased the property and we're actually putting a lot of capital to retrofit it. Uh, Why not do it right now? So it's almost like a two sides of the same coin of like, we just sold it you know, nothing we can do here, or we just bought one, or actually we, let's say we have student housing or senior housing or affordable housing in in which it's a more long-term hold, then in those cases, it just becomes more of of an immediate or low-hanging fruit to address. Yeah, that that makes, I didn't, uh, it didn't cross my mind. It should have. (laughs) The hold periods, because most of the organizations that I've worked with are three to five year holds, right? Exactly. And, uh-huh. and so, and I imagine if you showed up at my door, many of those are already into their three to five year holds. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's, it's that like comparing timelines and be like, is it going to be? <clears throat> um, yeah. And I do want to say like, depending on the territory, in some places you can see a payback of seven years In some other places. And actually I want to give a shout out to Illinois. Uh, in the Illinois Solar for All program, um, because we're seeing a lot of these rebates and additional incentives, almost like if it was a Lego uh, project that you start just stacking, and at the end yeah. of the day, it ends up paying for the whole thing. So there, we are seeing a lot, a lot of uh, potential in the market. Um, and with a lot of those projects, let's say if they see a payback longer than their whole period, they're going to start you know, even though there's research around solar increasing the asset value, um, as we know, it decreases operating expenses, therefore increase NOI. But I've had hesitancy from the side of, of you know, like the proof of the increase of asset value. Some have seen the the research and have gone, well, you know, something is worth what another person is willing to pay for it, which I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so I I see where they they can come from. From like, you know what? At, at the end of the day, it's like the asset at 
this position and if there's going to be another thing that's that's going to uh, put a risk on that sale, um, then they see it on that side. So I get it. Uh, in other cases, you know, if we can, if you actually have a a buyer that's excited about it, and let's say their portfolio is very ESG focused, then done deal. Um, but it could just yeah. be a question mark at that point. So, yeah, I think uh, it's it's a whole like first mover. <laughs> like as more and more people start adopting, that it become uh, it becomes a lot more, you know, a, as a done deal. I would imagine like the first AC units that went into apartments or the first yeah. whatever, people were like, well, it could be good, but I don't know if that has, how that's going to look or, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a matter of time that it becomes a lot more mainstream. Oh, I want to go back to the, the remark that you made about Illinois. And so I, I want to oh, tell yeah. you what I heard. And I want to make sure that that was what you were, you were saying. Yeah. So what right. I heard you saying was in that state, sometimes you can align uh, banking institutions and financing plus mm -hmm. state and local incentives that mm -hmm. come together to create potentially zero cost to put the infrastructure in place. Is that is that how I should think about that? Yes. And I would just a caveat. So a lot of these okay. credits and, and rebates that are available right now for solar projects, you can actually stack. So for example, there's the 30% uh, investment tax credit which is, think about it, your baseline, right? You would get okay. that 30% year one. Well, you also have a bunch of adders. So you have 10% energy communities. So that one is related to certain areas within the United States that are nearby, um, maybe oil uh, refineries or oil drilling in the past. Um, and basically... Wanting to invest in areas in which people were impacted by fossil fuel industry at some point. And there's also another adder that could be 10 or 20% for low moderate income. So, for example, if you have workforce housing or if you have Section 8 affordable housing, then boom, you have an extra. So, we got baseline 30%, we got 10%, which a good amount of the um, a good amount of Illinois has that is under that map, the 10% uh -huh. of energy communities, plus you got 10 to 20% of low moderate income. Let's say if you have a workforce housing there. So that's just tax credits. You can get, if I, my math is correct, you can get up to 50 or 60% tax credit there. Now there's the renewable energy credits, which are issued by the state. And the crazy thing about this, and it just, blows my mind <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. on solar is that they have this program, uh, Illinois Solar for All, in which it's really catered towards the low mo moderate income side. So the workforce housing, affordable housing. Uh, and the amazing thing is that they will pay you based on the production of the system. So the production, you can actually estimate it very easily. Uh, and that's usually any solar installer will give you that number. And the amazing thing is that the credit is very high. Um, it could get up to $180 per, per credit. Um, and the incredible thing is that they pay you on year one, 15 years worth of credits. Year yeah. one? Year one. Uh-huh. Yeah. I had the same expression, <laughs> just mouth open. <laughs> so now, yeah, let's go back to our, to our tower. So we had 50 to 60% tax credits, right? And now we can get, what, 40% or so uh, of these renewable energy credits. And the utility also has a credit. So in some cases, we literally just have the tower stacked of rebates. And next to it, you have the tower stack of costs. And you're like, wait a minute, they're the same. <laughs> or wait a minute. The rebates, in some cases, we've seen the rebates at actually a little bit higher than the cost. So just off the, off the bat, you're, you're entirely paying for the system. So that's why I wanted to give a shout out to them because I think a lot of these rebates and programs that actually benefit real estate are not being talked about enough uh, mm -hmm. of just how incredible they yeah. are. And you can literally put this in your, or in your asset 
um, if you qualify for a lot of this. And in the case of if you have market rate, um, let's say more luxury or condos, et cetera, housing, there's still a lot of credits too that are more market rate. So maybe instead of getting that 60% you get, or the 100% kind of stack, you might be getting right. 70% or 60%, which is still unreal. <laughs> like it's still oh, a man. really good, um, yeah, a re under the Illinois Shines <clears throat> program. So I wanted to, yeah, highlight that uh, just in case your listeners are like, wait a minute, this is my first introduction to solar and I happen to have buildings here where I literally, <clears throat> you know, the risk could be minimized in terms of uh, use of capital because of all of these incentives that I can start stacking up. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. That is wild. I, yeah, thank you for unpacking that because yeah, I think that, that would be truly meaningful to, to people who are listening and, and or watching. It, um, as you were going through that, my, my mind shifted a little bit to, to actual physical infrastructure Mm -hmm. on the asset and and again forgive my ignorance here but if mm -hmm. if you install a system your system in your community if i have a community you install it in my community am i immediately sort of taking like i hear a lot about the grid in right. the united states being taxed beyond imagination you have rolling brownouts here and there and mostly mm -hmm. in california but in other places too when you right. do this do you take do you relax some of the burden that's on that grid because now you're sort of self-sustaining? Is that right? Yeah, you like can that? look at it that way. Because in the case <clears> of, <throat> I mean, most of our systems are grid tied. So what that means is that you're and the tenants are still going to get, you know, power from the grid. Um, uh -huh. And the reason for that is really safety and reliability. So for example, at night uh -huh. or in some cases where there's not enough power coming from the solar, the tenants would not see any disruption. Um, and the other part about right. it is that when it comes to reliability of the grid, which I love to talk about, um, <laughs> is that, you know, a lot of, of the systems, and if you might have seen photos of huge uh, solar systems, maybe ground mounts, like in, you know, in a land, uh, yeah. what happens in a lot of those systems is that all of that power is getting exported into the grid. And so that adds more strain into the grid. Now, oh. with these type of systems, they're smaller. And just think about your quadplexes, your low rise or garden style type of, of systems, in which what you're doing is consuming power first, consuming that solar on site. And then whatever it doesn't get used gets exported. And so, yeah. in a way, you're kind of reducing strain on the grid based on consumption almost like that self-consumption element of it. Uh, we are a behind the meter technology. So in the private infrastructure side, um, so that helps a lot with the, with the grid element, um, which is, is really amazing because as we think about transitioning the grid, a lot of what we think about is, oh, we got to upgrade, we got to upgrade, which is true. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be the whole, like the door <laughs> that is there is like, oh, until we, we cannot put the system until we have to upgrade the, the grid. Um, but in these cases, we, their systems are so much smaller um, and consume locally that the grid upgrade doesn't become an issue. Uh, for these systems to be operating. Got so, yeah, it. That's... Is, that, is that really cool transition, but in a way that's like almost small scale transition. Yeah, you, you said that wonderfully. I, I was creating this image in my mind as you were unpacking that. And I, I had not thought about it from the perspective of you create a lot of solar energy and then that just goes right into the grid that is already taxed. But right. I can see what you're also saying and that you're sort of offsetting some of that every every building that goes solar sort of offsets what might be coming into the grid with solar creation of energy is is that right yeah that is right. one yeah that's one way to put it because i think um okay. the the fun thing with with a lot of this great grid integration and thinking about it is that you know you want to decarbonize or you want to transition the grid um, but at the same time, you have to do a lot of <laughs> upgrades. And obviously, you wouldn't want, as a real estate owner or developer, you, don't, you wouldn't want those upgrades to be 
on you. Uh, so sure. the smaller the systems, the, the more self-consumption you can do, then the less the need for that upgrade because there is less strain uh, on the on the grid system. So yeah, that, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and that's something that's going to become more and more uh, mainstream too as people talk about the grid. Um, as we see that in California, a lot with rolling blackouts and I mean that impacts tenants. That that impacts tenants on um, on different levels. That it's like if you can actually have a solution where not only you have solar installed, but in, in the case with batteries, you're actually giving resilience uh, to your tenants. In which you know that could be another another reason why to choose moving into your building as opposed to the the one next door. Um, let's say tenants that might have medical equipment that needs to be operated, something like this, that it's like, it's a no, um, yeah, you, you have to have it. So that's where it gets even more fun, uh, looking at pairing solutions and, and what can be done at that given place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think to your point about a, a non-negotiable, I'll give you a scenario yeah. where we owned a building in an urban setting and and if I say this or I misspeak, please correct me. But I'll go for the way it. I understood the way I understood this problem. So, let's say you have a an a electricity generation station right mm -hmm. here, and my building is like, and let's pretend like this is fifty miles away. I'm making yeah. that up, but there are a lot of consumers in between me and my building. Right? Uh -huh. We experienced a lot of interruption. Because we were the last building in this line Interesting. where station pushes power through the system. And right. it, it makes me think a solution like yours put in place mitigates for this disruption. For this lack of power. Yeah, because uh, I want to say one of the, and not to get super technical, <laughs> let me know if I'm you know, jumping into the hole. Nerd here. out. I love it. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, one of the, the things about the grid, it has to remain in balance, right? So if more people okay. are consuming power, then it has to supply more and more power. Well, what if that station that you were saying wasn't the only supplier? What if actually you were supplying solar and actually help level up the, the supply with the demand, right? So yeah. in a way... I think about these systems as almost like uh, uh, they're preventing a lot of these grid stress situation where let's say if there's more and more demand from the grid and if the supply is right here, well, if we have renewables and batteries helping to meet that demand, then we're going to have less of rolling blackouts. We're going to have much less of, of, in those cases, like the intermittent uh, power. So. Yeah, it's a way of like, how do we collaborate of these technologies and how amazing would it be to be like, all right, my side, my asset is not only helping the tenants have a, a more reliable power, but also helping the local uh, grid and helping the local transition. Um, so I think that, yeah, that's a, a pretty cool uh, value proposition. Yeah, I like. I, I'm learning so much because it's, uh, and and I don't even know if I articulated that problem correctly. It's just the way that that my mind understood it. Yeah, I mean that's we, that's a really good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it it would happen. Let's say it happened four to five times a year, but when it did, this is, you know, uh, controlled access buildings. So like all the systems, oh, yeah. <laughs> All the systems would break, and, and it's, mm -hmm. I mean they had backup, they had redundancy and things of that nature, but it was still you're relying on those those backups and, and redundancy systems more mm -hmm. than you would probably traditionally do so because you yeah. just have this thing happening. Yeah, in the renewable energy industry, um, on the nerdy side, we call that critical load. Uh, so basically, load. every okay. time everything that might be you know like security system, everything that's more like a common area. Uh, type, but if you run out of that, or if it's uh, no power in that, it's going to create an issue at the building. Um, so in this case, you likely have a battery connected to the critical load. And so if the power goes out, you can still have um, reliable, you know, entry systems. So people are not locked in or locked out in 
security systems, alarms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I know we had some, I don't know exactly what was in place, but I know was, there was something there as a backup or, oh, or even uh -huh. you know, scorch earth the door would just open so you didn't have a fire hazard, right? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. But still, that creates all kinds of other issues, right? Right, so, yeah. It turns into such a safety component at that point. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's right. So um, I'm, I'm interested in um, sort of the technical aspects of this, and, and maybe you could, you do a fantastic job of creating images um, out of words. Like, what does this look like when you, put it on a property? What does the physical product look like? Yes. Uh, I already have an analogy for it. Uh, so you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so think about the soul share as a garden hose and think about each single meter is a bucket, right? And the water is okay. power. So what the soul share is doing is supplying water or power to one bucket at a time, right? So it's going tenant A, tenant B, tenant C, blah, 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 going back almost like that rotating supply of solar. And okay. in this analogy, if the bucket overflows, uh, what that means is exports into the grid. So they're going to get credits on their utility, and that's going to show up as a benefit, additional benefit, right? So in that case, let's continue the analogy. Instead of having to go out and buy water <laughs> as much, uh, you're like, okay, I'm just using the one that's already on site. And let's say if somebody is out walking the dog, they're not using that much power at the moment, but the bucket is overflowing, no problem. They're going to get a credit in their utility bill. That's going to help them offset either the power that they use at night or the power that they're going to use on the next month. So it kind of helps balance out the equitable aspect of it. Um, but really what's really amazing on, on the technology is that on-site consumption. So think about other solutions, like people might have heard about virtual net metering or other solution. Uh, think like you're doing the garden hose analogy, but you're only supplying to one bucket and that one bucket is the common area. So all that spill, all that overflow gets credited back to the tenants. But the issue with that is that it, it is constantly up for debate on the policy side of things. So when you're investing in a solar system, you're typically investing for the lifetime of the system, which is 20 to 25 years. And if the credits back are up for debate or might be you know, uh, reduced, et cetera, which is a constant conversation, then you almost you almost start going into a situation where you created a cash flow analysis and you're like, wait a minute, now I'm going to get paid 40% less or whatever. And now it's just, you know, I have the system on my rooftop and I'm kind of stuck uh, with less and less of, of benefits. But if instead you had a system that was consuming on site, you're locking in the retail value of electricity, right? Because you're, you're saying like one for one, like, you know, let's say uh, a unit of power, I just don't want to get too deep into KWH, but uh, one unit of power, um, let's say it costs you 20 cents. Well, instead of gathering that from the grid, you're getting that from solar. So that's 20 cents right there. But what if tariff changes and if you export it or the overfill of the bucket, now they're giving you 10 cents uh, back from that overfill. So you're much better off consuming as much as you can on site than it is letting everything overflow. So that's really one of the the cool things about this is like the system is designed itself for uh, consumption on site and whatever gets exported gets credited. And so it almost helps future proof for whatever you know policy changes could happen when you know a good amount of this is being consumed on site. So yeah, let me know if you had any questions on the analogy, but I think that's usually one of the best ones, which is like, is a garden hose, is buckets, is water. You actually give power to each one of the tenants and the common area. It, make, it makes total sense to me. It Thank makes you. total sense yeah. to me. And, <laughs> Appreciate you know, it. You're, you're, you're great with analogies. I so the, uh, if I if I take that um, so I take that analogy and I start to think. A, a real physical thing. So I have panels on my roofs right. 
and the infrastructure the the conduit mm-hmm. comes down the side of the building or inside wherever the meters are is that yes. there's something that goes to the meters is that i'm picturing that in my head is that how that yes, works that is correct uh well um you were like i don't know i know nothing about solar you're like yeah you have this and the conduit <laughs> uh but no you <laughs> have your your inverter and then you have the solar um so essentially every solar installation has an inverter and then you simply just put in our product and our product is the one that creates that almost back to the garden hose example that rotating supply and so yeah. you can make so that each single tenant that is connected can get access to power the other thing I wanted to mention is that we know that uh, tenant churn is typically, I mean, it's expected. People move in and out. Sure. And so the interesting thing with our product is you can actually disconnect the solar to a unit via our portal. So oh. if a unit is vacant, tenant C is moving out, you can disconnect and actually have that power be sent to the remaining ones, to the existing ones. I love your reactions. This is how everybody should react. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. And the other thing too, uh, is that you can change the allocation of the soul share. So for example, you have three bedrooms versus studios. So you can give more power to the three bedroom, a little less to the studios just to make it more equitable. And then you can also, in cases with your common area, you can decide, I want to give more to the common area. We have EV charging, or actually I have uh, all of these expenses, or I have a laundry room that I want to take care of the operating expense of the utility bills. So give a, a bit more to the utility area. And then whatever is left over, let's give to the tenants. Um, so that's something that can be done and can be changed through our software and algorithm of the product. So you're sitting behind your desk, clicking a button, and it just, <laughs> that's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing because we know, and, and this is the reality, like every asset, every property, it's its own little world, like not sure. even within, like not every single uh, unit is going to look the same. Not every single unit is going to be occupied. Um, so having the ability to actually tailor to the asset yeah. is very important. Um, and you know, things can change. Like you can install EV charging, you can, uh, change the, the laundry system and, and now add it more. And now you have more expenses there. So as an asset owner, you can actually, you, you can actually pair that production with what type of consumption you're having on site. Is it right to think that you, um, like I'm trying to think through logically Mm-hmm. If I'm governing this in some way, I have to imagine you have some sort of calculator like, okay, mm-hmm. so I add EV or I add laundry or I add something that consumes power. Mm-hmm. I can't just arbitrarily make up the adjustment. Do you have something that helps me calculate that? Well, um, I want to say we probably were happy to kind of work alongside the solar installer and we, as well as the asset owner, will see the consumption uh, trends. Oh, okay. So in some cases, you could be like, all right, I want the production to match consumption a bit more. Let me just kind of adjust and see how much it pairs. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the the beauties of the system that you get that visibility into, uh, which opens another thing. Uh, a lot of real estate is actually very interested in certifications like, uh, with ESG, yeah. with GRASS, with Energy Star. And one big question that comes to mind is that sometimes they do have access to the common area meters in um, utility bills. So they know how much they're consuming, but they have no idea of the rest of the building because each tenant is individually billed. And so what this offers, it gives you visibility into the offset of the whole uh, asset. So you can actually see how much it's being consumed and how much solar is being delivered. So you can say, oh, okay, this is how much I'm being offsetting. Um, so it almost becomes like an add-on benefit that now reporting is so much easier because the number is right there as opposed to having to, I don't know, uh, talk to tenants and see if you can get bills or talk to the utility and see what you can do. So yeah, the, the power of visibility into a lot of data um, it's something that is 
that is constantly a need uh, for the real estate industry too. So you, you just said a word that brought to mind. You said data. Mm -hmm. It instantly brought to mind AI. Um, <laughs> and so I'm interested how I, I have to imagine AI is baked into your system or you use AI in some way, shape or form, or you're thinking about using AI. Can you kind of unpack that for us? How are you thinking about it? Yeah. That? So I think a big part of it is a, it's a little bit different. And I mentioned the company is international. So in the case of Australia, mm -hmm. for example, our product is a bit different in a way that they actually uh, follow consumption a bit more. And the reasoning for that is because mm -hmm their credits are so much different than whatever charges they get. So for example, in Australia, let's say they charge them 25 cents for the unit of electricity, but if you export it, it's seven cents. It's just such a drop that you really wanna optimize as much as possible to consume as much as you can on site. Versus a lot of the places where we are having projects in the US is one-to-one. -one. So for example, let's say it's 20 cents to consume. And if you export it, it's 20 cents, right? So there's a bit less of that immediate need, but with the way of changing the, uh, the allocation, there's almost like a, like a manual way to, to kind of share, but I want to say the optimizing and that's happening in Australia because of the market, which, you know, wink, wink, we might see that in the US uh, later on. It's, yeah. it's one of those things that it's, you know, it's an adapting of the technology with the market so you can actually prioritize self-consumption as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, but at this stage with the social in the US, we really, the self-allocation, it's the biggest part. Got it, got it. Mm -hmm. I, I was just imagining also sort of an A, not an AI component, but rather an automated component where mm -hmm. the, the system is smart enough at some point there's kind of self-governance mm -hmm. all this stuff is just really done by mm -hmm. a computer even though you have a human there that can pay attention to what's going on there's yeah. there's really not much to do in terms of touching yeah. even a notice to vacate you into our software team now <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go i think that's the solution <laughs> be, be part of the development i love it <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, this is a this is a type of insights we need. Um, and we're we're seeing that with the market. I think one of the key takeaways, like if you walk away with anything, uh just learning a few more concepts with solar, the biggest part is just looking at the real estate industry as an opportunity to pair uh existing technologies. So solar being one of them. And once you dig into solar and incentives um then you're like wait a minute <laughs> i'm gonna pair i could pair this and by the way it pays for itself or majority pays for itself and i can use this as a as a way to differentiate myself with the the different you know the competition or the different trends that are coming in so yeah it's a it's something that is exciting about this pairing of technologies yeah, it's. Uh, I got to tell you about it. It's a. Uh, I got to tell you rather. It's. It's talked about a lot more today. Let's say, in the last four years plus minus, it's been a conversation for a long bit of time. But it seems to be amplified. You know, in the last four to six years plus minus, it's becoming even more amplified now. And mm -hmm. you know, if you give whatever context you set that in, it is. It is coming, and mm -hmm. it is something that is important, right. and uh, it is. It is incumbent upon all of us to figure out how to make it a benefit for not only the owner of the property, right, or the municipality at large, but the consumer in general. Right. If you can make it win-win-win across all those constituents, it's it's uh, mm -hmm. it's a much better day for everybody on yeah. the backside. Exactly, and and something we really <laughs> focus on is creating a net benefit for everybody. Um, so in this case, tenants will benefit. They're see, they're going to see their overall uh cost of energy and being so much lower um asset owners would benefit because now not only they get lower costs of operating expenses with the common area being lower uh common area bills but they also get a new revenue stream of solar as an amenity to the asset um and plus they get to yeah differentiate themselves uh get all the 
accreditations and etc um that are going to you know put them in a, a leadership perspective and then yeah we're all on the largest scale with the grid decarbonization etc uh there's going to be a benefit there too so yeah we're we're here uh, to help demystify solar for real estate i think that's the biggest part uh but yeah it's a it's a fun endeavor to do well, I, I, I want to play off of your demystifying remark mm -hmm. um, to ask you some rapid fire questions before yeah, we close it. up here. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm going to do rapid fire and then I'll give you an opportunity to tell uh, our listeners and our viewers where they can find out more, um, not only about your company, but about yourself if they want to reach mm -hmm. out directly. So are you ready? I have four yes. rapid fire questions. Go in, for it. Okay. So on, on the demystifying sort of segue, what's... What is one myth about renewable energy in, in urban areas um, that you would like to debunk? Oh, uh, the one myth <laughs> is about blackouts, um, which if you have solar on site, it doesn't mean that you're going to have power during a blackout. Uh, and the reason for that is because safety. So a lot of these projects right. in solar actually has to be offline in case that there's uh, workers on the lines, et cetera. And it's called the anti-eye landing effect. Um, but in that case, you would need to have like battery backup or something like that. So that is definitely something I want to demystify the, the comparison of solar immediately with um, reducing blackouts. You'll have to pair technologies. Oh, good to know. Mm -hmm. I would have thought what you described. So I'm glad I don't think yeah, that anymore. Yeah. I, I, I thought about it myself and I was like, wait a minute. I had to have a couple engineers <laughs> explain that to me. So just passing on the gospel. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So second question. If, uh -huh. you, if you had unlimited resources and all the power in the world, what is the first thing that you would tackle to make energy universal? Oh, do like, okay, national or international? It, it was like, International, I would just subsidize solar at an unreal rate, like eighty percent or something. Because um, yeah. I think, yeah, I wanna, I wanna incentivize those first adopters uh, that are going out there and and putting out the technology and be like, hey, no cost to you, but just see how amazing it is and, and get your neighbors involved. Yeah, because then you create these sort of um, this viral network, right? Exactly. If you can get the first kind of the mm -hmm. sneezers <laughs> in place. Exactly. Then... Yeah, that's probably yeah. what I would do. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, third question. Um, I'm, I'm really, what I'm looking for here is what, what inspired you? Um, let's say you woke up one day, you weren't thinking about renewable energy and solar, uh -huh. right? You're just rocking along in life, but then something happens that mm -hmm. gives cause for you to go, oh, I'm all in on that. What oh, is yeah. that person, book, resource, whatever? What did it, what happened? Yeah. So uh, real quick. So when I grew up in Colombia, I just saw a lot of deforestation in my community. So I was very passionate about anything I could do to actually defend the environment. But I also, oh. my family is very like, in, they brought in economics to me. So I was like, what is that in between? What is like, How can I protect the environment, but make financial sense? And to, solar almost became like a, uh, you know, a moment of like, wait oh. a minute, you could have energy production, make money, but also protect the environment. So that, that was actually the, the hold of, of passions of like, all right, let's go into this more and more. Um, but really coming from a perspective of, I want to protect um yeah the yeah. environment and and everything so part of an activist with the main of, uh the mind of an economist <laughs> ah i like it i yeah. like it mm -hmm. so it, it was a sort of an evolution to a point where this this big uh, ray of sunshine came in to, to, exactly to okay. evolution to that okay. point mm -hmm. <laughs> okay all right that is awesome um okay the last one um what would you say is is your the most rewarding part of your work mm -hmm. um like you you something happens and you go wow that's why i do this every mm -hmm. day yeah i want to say seeing the data on tenant savings that is just uh, amazing uh because that that really translates to people uh having more cash uh to themselves yeah. you know we've had interviews with tenants where they will tell us like oh i 
I actually ended up putting this money into a business I'm starting or actually kind of for more groceries now. Um, so yeah, is that social component makes it all worth it. Oh, that's cool. So you, you actually get to hear some of those stories where people have. Exactly. Yeah. And plus those, seeing oh. it in person. I mean, back to the development, uh, comparison earlier, I'm sure a lot of real estate developers listening the first time you saw your project complete in front of you, just that moment of like, I did it. Look at the beauty <laughs> that's right in front. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had that every time I go visit the projects that we worked on. Oh, I love that. I love that for you, but I love that for the world. That's very, exactly. very cool. Exactly. Yeah. Thank All you. right. Well, Mel, I, I want to thank you for investing some time with me today, but I also want to give you an opportunity to tell listeners where they can learn more about your company, but also about you specifically if they wanted to reach out directly. Yeah, of course. Well, thanks again for having me. This has been incredible. So much fun. Uh, so <laughs> feel free to check us out at alumenergy.com slash US. Um, and also, I mean, I'm very open. If you wanted to just send me an email at mel at Um happy to chat more. I mean, you know, this is this is one of those things that we've got to keep the conversation going and and help merge those two industries as much. So feel free to reach out if you like. Um, and very excited to see where the industry is going to go. Awesome. Well. Mel, again, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. This was amazing. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.